Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everyone. Before I introduce our guest for today, I wanted to say thank you to our listeners in Great Britain, Canada, Australia, Sweden, Ireland, Denmark, Australia, and New Zealand, and really all around the world. If you haven't yet been in contact from any of those parts of the world or really anywhere that you are living, please be in contact and let us know not only what your interest is in the show, but if there's a particular group or a particular movement, something that is a new trend that's really worrisome because it has kind of cultic tendencies that we might not know about here in the States, please inform us so that we can research it and maybe find a guest who can come on and talk about it. So thank you very much, really, from us to you all over the world. And now, for today, I am so pleased to be able to have Sarah Steele on the show. Sarah Steele is the creator and host of the Let's Talk About Sects podcast, where she produces and writes all of the episodes herself. And today you can actually hear my guest appearance on that podcast by following the link in the show notes of this episode or just search for Let's Talk About Sects wherever you get your podcasts. In addition to podcasting, Sarah is also a filmmaker and writer with a keen interest in social sciences, culture, and psychology. Her writing has been published in The Guardian, IndieWire, and The Metro. She's also produced for ABC Radio National's Earshot program. Her debut book about cults, charisma, and coercive control, Do As I Say, is out now and available in hard copy, paperback, and ebook formats. You can find out more about Sarah and her work at ltas.pod.com. Here is Sarah now. I want to warmly welcome Sarah Steele to the podcast today. It is such a pleasure to talk to you. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Rachel. It is really good to talk to a fellow podcaster and uh, someone also who is an author. I'm in the middle of penning something at the moment that I've haven't had the time for up until now. I still don't have the time, but I'm trying to make the time. <laughs> um, and so I want to be able to talk to you about how this uh, show in a lot of ways has changed you and changed your perception about things. But let's let's talk first, if we can, about what brings you to this whole world. I mean, to have a to have a show that's called Let's Talk About Sex, it is something where you are going to be doing a deep dive if each episode is about this. So clearly there is an interest. And so what drives it? Yeah, I mean, initially the interest was quite similar to, I'm sure, the interest of many of my listeners, which is just trying to understand the the dynamics of these organizations and ha- how is it that they replicate across different societies, sort of no matter the cultural background, why is this a human dynamic that happens and, and how, how do these groups enmesh people, kind of get them to behave in ways that they otherwise might not at all. And so it was driven initially by that interest. And at the time, I was making short films. My background was filmmaking. uh, And I thought maybe I could do a podcast and I wouldn't have to get a whole film crew together. So an audio documentary project sounded quite appealing. And at the time there weren't other podcasts about cults, which is pretty wild to think about now because, you know, it's, it's huge these days, but I was interested in learning more. But the thing is, once I started doing it, I started speaking with people who had had these direct experiences and I was speaking to different survivors and it just became really obvious to me that this is actually a huge social justice issue. Like this is a much bigger problem in society than I had been aware of. So the motivation became entirely different. And I think educating people around these groups, how they operate, how it's not as uncommon a problem as you think it might be, and giving voice to 
people who have had these experiences and want to speak about them in depth. That became the motivation for the project. Very interesting that you mentioned social justice, because sometimes people will ask me, what fuels this fire of mine to do this, especially after being, you know, harassed by different groups and I keep going. (laughs) Maybe it's stupidity, who knows, but uh, hopefully not. But what is really interesting is that I've often called it a human rights issue. So it's very similar sort of thing when you talk about social justice. So tell me about that. I mean, I do think it's the same. You know, you speak about human rights and uh, I I put out a book last year called uh, Do As I Say and there's a whole section about human rights and how these groups uh, are really impinging on various aspects of what we understand human rights to be. And so it just really astounded me to kind of find out that essentially most of our societies, you know, with a couple of exceptions, I suppose, are really content to just let these groups continue to operate. And they're not, in many cases, they're not breaking any laws, but you've got so many people coming out of them who have experienced so much trauma um, and often financial abuse and other types of abuses. And it just kind of floored me to, to realize that this was going on and a lot of our societies have sort of thro- thrown our hands up and said, well, not much, not much to be done. That is very true. And I think, you know, um, having the legal system, justice system catch up with the need here, it's very slow going and sometimes at a snail's pace. But I think it's really true that you're dealing with rights being taken away or just never being given to someone who was born and raised in a particular group. I I think about the word consent quite a lot because there are a lot of people who I'm sure you've talked to and people who I work with who, by and large, are very sure that they gave their consent. And they're very sure that they wanted the abuse and they deserved it. And it was what was best for them. And just breaking that down so that there is a sense that they actually had rights in that moment and that somewhere outside, they may have been able to say no and really feel it and mean it and have that honored, but that there is something all too clever about manipulators who really convince people that they have invited in being mistreated. Have you come across that? Yes, absolutely. And becomes a little clearer when we look at uh, how some countries are bringing in laws around coercive control, but these laws where they exist, they only relate to uh, kind of one-on-one domestic abuse situations, but the dynamics, as you know, are the same in many instances. And so you can see we're starting to become a lot better at asking, you know, mostly women, let's say, a lot of women who come out of these uh, relationships, why, why didn't you leave? Why did you stay? But it's that's not yet reached the the subject with cults. It's still the most common question I think that people get having come out of cults is why did you stay? Why didn't you leave? And I guess why did you join? Uh, which it, it just it it shows the the level of misconception I think around the the subject still that we are asking those questions. But yes, when you look at coercive control and how it operates, it sort of, it doesn't matter if you uh, believe that you made a choice to be in that situation. If there was coercive control involved, we can see that that should be framed as a a crime in certain circumstances. So I, I wonder somewhere down the line if it might be possible to see it in the circumstances of cults as well. You know, that, that phrase, um, why did I stay? It was, it's asked, of me so often that I did a, uh, well, I, I have it on my website. You can actually download this whole thing I wrote, which is, why did I stay? And there are really, really valid reasons that people stay and sometimes for their own safety, even though they're not safe there, but they feel like it would be safer to stay. But it is also true, just as we're talking about, that that really should never be the question It could be a question, I think, and I would foster people asking it of themselves so that they understand, they understand what was up against them leaving and mm, why they may have felt that it was safer to stay. But, But when it is that everyone descends upon the victim and asks them that question, 
then they're missing the point and they're missing the right person who they should be asking questions of, uh, which I, I think happens time and time again. The thing that I found, the more people I spoke with and the more that I understood their experiences, and the thing that I think people who haven't had these experiences themselves could think about better is that I always end up asking myself the question when I'm interviewing someone who who is a survivor of a culture group who's managed to get out. You know, I think about the world that they were in, the belief system that they were in, often they were born into it. They never knew anything else, but whether or not they were, like what they would have to leave behind, their conception that if they leave, uh, they'll lose everything, they maybe will go to hell, but their life will be destroyed, you know, and and the actual community that they'll leave behind. It could be their entire network of family and friends. They might know no one outside of the group. So the question I always end up asking myself is, had I been in their situation, is there any way that I could have found the strength in myself to leave? And I really don't know that I could because I think it's just incredibly impressive when anyone has managed to leave a situation like this. And so, yeah, kind of turning the question on itself and asking for those of us who haven't had that experience, whether we could have found the strength to leave is maybe a different way of looking at it. I like that because, you know, When people sometimes talk to people who have been involved in cults or people who are in abusive relationships, it can feel like there is this, for lack of a better term, sort of superiority in the way that they're taking that on and and saying, you know, oh, hmm, you know, I don't know why you stayed. But if people really do honestly have to ask themselves that question, I think they wouldn't come across with so much hubris and more insight, which I would hope for, actually. And so I wonder also about, you know, when we think about just social justice and we think about what people really need, I think in order to be able to, let's say, leave a bad situation, that they need to know there's someone out there who's going to help them or guide them. They need to know there are going to be resources. They need to know there's going to be help for themselves or their children also, if, you know, part of the reason they're staying is because they have children. But I wonder just about then society in general, and if there are things that society is not really providing for people to be able to feel safe, to be able to feel steady in their lives. It's sort of prompting them to be searching or prompting them to tolerate bad situations that they shouldn't. You know, with if you zoom out and see sort of the big picture, what are you noticing about society at large and kind of, I guess, in wishful thinking, right? What do we wish could be different about it? Yeah, I mean, you're getting to the the big questions around equality and opportunity and uh, I think community, you know, a lot of people, they're they're looking for community. And I mean, that's with with the podcast kind of taking a deep dive into a different cult each episode. It's now in season six, you know, we've been through a few now. And I think I'm always trying to demonstrate that these groups, they're not about one thing, like they might be religious, or it could have been a martial arts school, or it could have been a a socialist group that someone joined. So it's, to my mind, like there's a self-protection mechanism for most people to think, well, I would never join a cult. But actually, I would say you probably just didn't come across the right group or the wrong group at the wrong time, because we know that people join often at a vulnerable point in their lives. So it's not that they're a vulnerable person and we all have vulnerable points in our lives, but really they've just come across a group that seems incredibly appealing and we all join different groups and they've just had incredibly bad luck that it turned out to be a cultic group because what you're seeing on the outside is not a cultic group at all. It's a welcoming group that that seems like a wonderful community to join. And so, yeah, I think outside of these groups, there's something lacking in terms of community. There are definitely ways that we could have better communities that make people feel valued and welcome. And a huge thing is always just your basic levels of equality in a society. Uh, What can we be doing better in terms of giving people less vulnerable points in their lives that they would become susceptible to groups like this? And uh, I guess the other thing that I think about a lot is if our societies have decided to sort of throw our hands up and say too hard basket to kind of do anything proactive about these groups, then I think we need to do a lot more to make sure that there are paths out for people who have become enmeshed in these groups so that they do feel that there are options to exit. And that's like a really good 
safety net, um, making sure that there's kind of funds available for them to set up what could be an entirely new life. They may not have ever opened a bank account. They may have numerous children. I mean, there are very different extremes of these experiences, but I think that, you know, getting the right help from a therapist, obviously, someone like you who has that real understanding of what they've been through, that's really important too. And I think that we should be doing more to create paths out if we're not going to do so much to stop the paths in. Yeah, I think that, you know, sometimes people will uh, need therapy. Sometimes people need a place to stay that's safe. Uh, they need to be able to also um, know that if people from the cult are coming after them or trying to reach them, that they have people protecting them, that they are, they're they not going to be vulnerable uh, in the same way that they were before. And I've found that there are also some organizations that people get involved in that turn out to be kind of inherently problematic, it turned out to be a religious organization. It was trying to save people who were, you know, having a hard time or needing to connect and then wanted to proselytize them. So they felt sort of out of the frying pan into the fire and it was hard to just get the help that they needed or the items that they needed without being told what to believe. Mm, yeah, I think that that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, there are you know, wonderful religious people who who do do fantastic work in society and often these services are provided by people who are religiously motivated and I think that can be a wonderful thing but as you say in some circumstances it's actually not appropriate at all right yeah and so it it is true yes and I'm glad that you mentioned that there are a number of religious organizations that are trying to reach out to help people who need to really be enveloped in back into society and they are offering some really great services. And then, yes, there are others where the these poor people feel just as judged and just as pushed um, by the people trying to save them. So I do think that it, it, it is a good conversation, I think, to try to figure out what resources are needed. I want there to be, you know, a place where people can go, even kind of a very healthy temporary residential place where they can be away and they can be with each other and be fed and be safe and then get help, get therapy. You know, these places, um, they, they had existed here and there, but they, I don't know of any that exist now. So if anyone is sitting on a couple million who wants to put that together, call us. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fantastic? And just so that they can have their immediate needs met so that they can then consider what the other things that they need to figure out are. Yeah. You know, immediate needs is interesting because I, I had a client years ago who uh, I actually told this his story on the podcast. He gave me permission to do so, but he had someone who came in and moved into his home and had taken over his home and it was a grifter and had separated him from his wife and then was well anyway long story but he was kept up all night and then had to work during the day and when he would come to see me this was in new york he would come to see me could barely keep his eyes open so i would plan actually didn't i, I just kept this a secret because i i knew that i wasn't this wasn't going to be met well <laughs> by the people who were running this place, I would plan two hours to meet with him and say that it was a two hour session. And one hour he would nap. <laughs> and then for the other hour, he would either continue napping if he needed it, or we would talk. Because I thought if he can't keep his eyes open, there's no way that anything that we talk about is going to be making an impact. And sometimes people just need to sleep. And so I wonder also just for you, you know, now that you, have developed this expertise, once you do that, you develop also this real nuanced understanding of things and a, sometimes a whole new way of seeing things. And so if you can kind of take us magically back in time from your pre-podcast era and kind of give us, if you remember, what your vision was of what a cult is and manipulation to where it is now and how things have changed for you? I can think of a few key things that are kind of the bigger things. And 
uh, I'm sure they would be where a lot of people still come from today is that my my main understanding of cultic groups was the really big sensationalist stories that I'd heard. But they'd led me to believe that a cult, you know, it has to be off on a commune or people are physically separated from society in order to be a part of that group. And that is often the case, but it is often not the case at all, as you well know. Uh, and so the idea that people could still be enmeshed in a group that is so controlling of them, but still be your neighbor going to school with you, going to university with you, but still actually in their minds be so trapped. That was a real eye opener to me. And it took me a while to really understand that concept and how that works. And I feel, you know, slightly embarrassed about some of the questions that I would have asked in the beginning, but people were so patient with me trying to help me to understand how this worked and made some amazing friends just through, uh, through going through that journey. And so that was a really big one. And then I think the other ones include things like I, when I set out on the project, I wanted to be really careful about defining what a cult is because, you know, it can be a pretty nebulous term. And so I think it's important to kind of be specific. But even through the years that I've done the project, it's become quite clear to me that some of those concepts that I had in the beginning were also incorrect because. The idea of the charismatic leader, for instance, most groups do have some sort of charismatic leader, but many groups, as you know, the leaders passed on, the person who founded it, they might have even been ousted from the group, but the the systems that they've set up within the group continue on. Um, sometimes, sometimes they fall apart, but oftentimes they do continue on and the group itself has just sort of become controlling and, and cultic and that you know, that's a real eye opener to me too, that you can have that that original leader removed from the the situation and they still continue on. So I think that that also is a huge one. And so I think when I'm looking at what makes a group cultic these days, I think it's more from a psychological perspective of having a bit of a a checklist of these are these are things that might indicate that a group is a cult. If you're ticking off like 80% of these things, you, you might have a problem. You might only tick off one or two and that means per- perhaps the group is not actually cultic, but it has a couple of things that it needs to really look at and could improve. But it's almost seems more like a like a diagnostic checklist in a way, if that makes sense. Right. And interestingly, there have been a couple of groups that actually have looked at their ways that, that were not so healthy and have been committed to changing them, which is interesting because they really... Um, it got out of hand and that that wasn't their original intention. And I really value when people can do that, when they are able to be introspective in that way and, and be willing to make the changes. And yeah, there, yeah, I've worked with people who um, never met the cult leader because the cult leader had died many years ago, but it was still existing as, as though he was there. I think usually if there's this sense that they have supernatural powers, that somehow they're still running it and they can read your mind and they're still speaking with you. But I also remember feeling like, hmm, are people who get involved in cults, are they weird? Is there something really off about them? And that just seemed like this very strange kind of esoteric life that I, there's no way that I could somehow relate to their experience, you know, Um, but it's so not the case, truly not the case. And it's very interesting to hear you talk about what you now see and what you understand. And, and I wonder about the rest of the world being able to kind of get that sense of it as well. I'm sure part of the reason that you do your podcast is to be able to do your part to have that exponential impact to educate people beyond you to really get it. And I wonder if you feel like that's happening, that society at large to some degree is starting to understand this better. I do feel like there have been improvements over the time that I've been doing this work. I feel like a lot of the, I'm seeing more nuanced coverage uh, and more Over here, you know, we have some tabloid media that would traditionally be the the types of media who would cover these stories and they would do them from very sensationalist angles. But we're getting uh, much more of the the mainstream media or the, you know, more progressive media also covering these stories in much more nuanced ways. I've definitely seen that. And I don't think it's just that I've become more aware of it. I do think that that is the case that that's been happening. But we have a, we have really over here in Australia, some of the most extreme defamation laws anywhere in the world. So it makes these subjects really difficult to talk about because a former cult member might 
speak about their experiences. And then if the group has a lot of money, they'll just sue them for defamation and they get punished again in in so many ways. And it has a real chilling effect on being able to tell a lot of these stories. So that's a real problem, particularly over here. But yeah, definitely. uh, I I hope that there's been some impact from, from the work that I've been doing, but it's interesting. I think also it is true to say that we are more across these types of media stories and we are more aware of them. And I didn't think when I started this project that I would still be doing it seven years later. And a lot of people ask me, you know, when are you going to run out of cults to cover? And I mean, I think you and I would laugh at that question because it's absolutely, I could do it for the rest of my life and never run out of groups. Like that's, (laughs) that is not a problem. And I think that that really demonstrates the misconception as well, that there, there would be a possibility of groups to run out of to cover. Even if you and I just made a list and divided them and we both tried, there's no way. There's no way. And yeah, I mean, you know, like all the time groups are coming to my attention that I've never heard of before. And there are so many that are so secretive that you can't even Google them. Like you're just not going to be able to cover all of them ever. And so uh, I often think, because I've been doing it for so long now, it's like, oh, isn't the education piece done yet? Can't we move on to the advocacy piece yet? And I think that that is probably, that's naive. Like the education piece does still need to continue to happen. And so we do need to keep telling these stories to uh, try to help people understand exactly how they operate and what, what the issues are around them. I think also with like you're saying with defamation, which is really problematic, uh, also so many cults are getting clever and having people sign non-disclosure agreements. So, you know, people are rendered powerless and voiceless to a great degree, even though I think if you sign that under duress or are kept from reading it before you sign it, you have some legal recourse, but still you don't know that, that you do. So I feel like cults, cult leaders often have and retain more control, power, more rights, more freedom than those who get involved, which really should be turned around. And then there's something about this that makes people feel a lot of the time that they have to prove something about themselves to you about how they would never succumb to this, which I think keeps people from really being educated. Because if, uh, you know, I've given talks on cults and when I did more of that in person, almost inevitably someone from the audience would raise their hand and say, I would know never to blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, my kid would be smart, too smart to something. And I thought, are you taking in this, the educational piece here, or are you using this as a forum to try to prove something about you? And so often I wanted to say, um, you know, about the doth protest too much, Um, like you're making yourself look bad. Um, you know, I or I wanted to say, oh, I'm sorry, was this about you? Um, <laughs> but so I think that people need to be open to the idea that it could happen to them and it's not a mark against them. They don't have to be afraid of the thought. It it means you're a human being because people will say, what does it mean when someone gets, well, it means they're a human being and human beings are able to be open to ideas, open to needs that they want to have fulfilled, open to false promise, open to manipulation. Um, We are social beings. It's part of our survival, but it also means that these things can happen to us too. It doesn't mean anything more than that, I think. Yeah. And I think it is a real self-protection mechanism. People really want to believe that that would never happen to them. It makes them feel safer and is definitely unhelpful. Like it would be much more helpful for people to understand that this could happen to them because then they can really identify with these people much better, put themselves in someone's place who has been through this experience and really have the correct amount of sympathy for that situation. But I have a personal experience, which I wrote about in my book because I felt that it kind of helped to demonstrate it's not quite the same as being in a cult, but I was essentially ripped off by a con woman who was uh, a relative of my partner. And uh, the experience that I went through with that, like a lot of people afterwards would offer me all kinds of advice and, you know, like how to avoid a situation like that in the future. And I think that it it helps to feel like you, you could have avoided a situation like that, but there's a lot of benefit in your life 
to trusting other people. Most of the time, there's only upside to trusting other people because most people are good and they don't have ulterior motives in what they're doing in your life. And so I think it's where that that phrase really rings true. It's sort of like, fool, fool me once, shame on you, and fool me twice, shame on me. Until someone proves that they're not trustworthy, you get a lot more out of life in general if you trust them. People who go through the world not trusting other people, they live you know, fairly small and negative lives. And I don't think that they're good lives. So, or they could be better. And so I think it's easy to have uh, an idea that something wouldn't have happened to you and it's a self-protection mechanism. But in fact, if you understand that, like that, they're, they're just, you haven't come across the particular group that would have appealed to you at a particular point in your life and perhaps when you had a need that that could have been filled by that group then you you still really are totally misunderstanding how these groups operate and then yes in that case i think they can't be listening to what you're saying in full or receiving it properly right and you know i i remember i think i may have told the story on the podcast a, a while ago but i was giving a talk about cults and influence to the parents at a particular high school years ago. And there were these four women in the front row, all dressed nearly identically. It was one of these rare days in uh, Los Angeles when it was raining, but they all had the same rain boots, the same style, the same what a, I don't know, designer label on it and um, jeans and a black, I mean, really like they came in uniform, but they, I think they all thought they all looked kind of independently cool. But what was interesting was they were sure that they could not be influenced. And they talked about at the end, oh, I would know and we would know and my kids would never blah, blah, blah. And uh, I said, well, Let's imagine uh, that the techniques of influence that are used in a cult are also used in business and are also used in advertising. So think about why you buy what you buy. And they said, what, what do you mean? I said, and I kind of like, I put my arm out, like I swept it to the side, like, look at all of you, <laughs> like, like, just take a look down for a second and notice that you're all wearing the same thing, basically. Why is that? And that can't be that you're not under the influence of something. Now, it's is it nefarious? No, it's someone can make money off of you. They're not teaching you, you know, they're not t- taking you away from your family and, you know, harming you in other ways. But to not notice even the soft signs of it is very interesting. And I want, I do want to invite people to really look at that and to know too that people are going to take advantage of that. The one I think about a lot is uh, like I've been gone around the corner and had my my legs waxed and it's like incredibly painful. And I'm just like, why am I paying money to have the hair removed from my legs with wax strips? And if you really hammer down on that, it's like, because society has told me that it is not a good thing to have hair on my legs. Why is that? I mean, it's just such a simple thing that it's kind of like we are all influenced by the the society that we live in and the powers around us and the various peer pressures and all of those things. And you can see it in so many ways when you really start to think about it. The idea that you wouldn't be susceptible to that kind of influence is so incorrect. Yes, so very incorrect. I'm wondering too, just as we're finishing up, you know, you have had the chance to really also been when you're doing this for a period of time, you can see trends, you can see new things that come up. And, you know, I have that when I get calls and suddenly there's just a flood of calls about something like, you know, years ago, three years ago, it was conspiracy theories and people who were losing their loved ones to these ideas. And then it was different healing techniques or something. And so I wonder what you've seen as of late, what trends have you noticed? And also what trends are alarming to you that you think we really need to watch out for? Yeah. I mean, I think the the ones that you just mentioned, I've definitely noticed those as well. And conspiracy theories, uh, I've had that impact my own family. You know, personally, I know a number of people who fell 
to a lot of conspiracy theories and kind of uh, became quite angry, I would say. And that's been really, really alarming to me to see that happen. I don't think that one's going away. I don't know if your experience is that that one's going away at all. I think that that's still a problem and it's um, in a lot of ways only becoming worse because of the ways that kind of social media is operating and how that's fragmenting disinformation, misinformation around, you know, current global events is just so absolutely rife and we seem completely under-equipped to do anything about it. It feels like we didn't necessarily learn the lessons from the disinformation and misinformation that informed elections in the past. I have really big concerns that that's going to continue to uh, inform elections around the world in the future if we don't (laughs) figure out how to do something about it. But yeah, like the wellness industry, there's a lot in there that uh, seems to be an issue. Coaching, I had some recent conversations with uh, people in the coaching industry and that seems really, really unregulated, but that's been a problem for quite a while as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's anything that I've seen particularly recently on top of those trends. Is there anything you've seen? The interesting thing that I've seen of course, coaching is is a big problem. And people who call themselves healers, please, anyone who's going to anyone, check out credentials. And don't just go by the terms that are used after someone's name or the initials. Find out what that means, really means. And also, it's true that just because someone is licensed doesn't mean they're going to be healthy and good, but you will have more recourse if something happens because you'll have a board you can talk to about it in a way that you can't if someone does not have a license. What I have seen that is alarming to me is the desensitization to terms that are paranoid, to ideas that are paranoid, ideas that are conspiratorial. They become so much a part of mainstream lexicon that I think people don't know how they sound anymore. And when someone comes out with an idea that is outlandish, it doesn't sound so anymore. And so I am worried about that. Yeah, what is that's kind of like shifting of the Overton window, or have I got that right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that there's a really big question there around the media and how how these things get covered in the media. That's a really really tricky one because you see it obviously with climate change. It's like trying to have balance on the idea that you know 99.9 percent of scientists agree with is like it's it's caused a lot of chaos. So. But yeah, shifting the conversations where something that used to sound really radical now is fairly acceptable. It's it's a concerning trend to see for sure. It really is. And I think also the idea that you can do this sort of deep fake and you can create something that isn't a person, but seems like a person, but is this sort of alternate thing. I don't know how that's different from being involved in a cult where you don't know whom to trust. You don't know if the person in charge is really who they say they are. I mean, it's. I think it's hard to feel like you're on steady ground. And it seems important then to connect with things that are tried and true, to find your anchors, things that you really know and people you really know you can trust. Um, going back to your you know, your thoughts about society and and community and, and what's needed there, I think all the more so now. That is absolutely right, because we're going to see, you know, many more of these through AI, like there's just a deluge coming. And so we need to be able to know what we can trust and who we can trust. And I see a big risk for many more people falling to all sorts of conspiracies. And also like being aware of which of the conspiracies are actually real, right? How do you even figure that out? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I do I think that I can trust the government all the time? There's no way. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> right? But it doesn't keep me up at night. I don't need to build, you know, um, something in underground, whatever. I'm just going to go about my day and I'm going to connect with what I know to be real and true and good and move forward if I can. But I know for other people, it's harder for them to shift gears in that way. Um, Just as we're finishing up, and I've loved having all this time to talk to you, any other thoughts before we finish? No, honestly, I just, I really want to thank you for the the work that you do and the resources that you've put out into the world, because I found them incredibly valuable when I'm, when I'm speaking to people and um, particularly 
family and friends who are trying to understand what they can do about uh, their loved one ending up in a cult. And, um, you know, it's such a, it's a really difficult one to even be able to offer any advice on. And I just think, yeah, the resources that you've put out are incredibly helpful. And so thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad. I'm really glad that that they have been helpful. It is a pleasure. And so everyone check out, check out, let's talk about sex and your book as well. And anything else, where can people find you? Yeah, I'm on uh, most social media platforms. So uh, Facebook, Instagram, but uh, the best place is really just have a listen to the podcast if you, if you would like to. Yeah, let's talk about sex. Thanks, Rachel. Very nice. A pleasure. Thank you so much, Sarah. One more thing before you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sarah, for your interview today and for doing all the work that you do to help people out there, to educate them about these particular issues. There were so many points that were brought up that uh, it's hard for me to narrow something down, actually. But there is an interesting link between some of the topics that Sarah brought up, and I'll explain what I mean. When she was talking about how there are a lot of people who have had very damaging experiences with therapists, and there are people who were born and raised in cults also who are trying to come out of that situation and trying to find a way to connect and feel like they have something in common with the rest of the world. And also the idea that she brought up about when you have been manipulated in this way, you just feel like you always have to blame yourself because you were blamed. Because as we know, within controlled and controlling environments, run by people who are manipulators. Whatever is good that happens to you is because of them. And whatever is bad that happens to you is because of you. It seems to be an absolute, an absolute equation. And it's also absolutely wrong and absolutely unfair. You should never have to give credit to somebody else when you only give blame to yourself. And if you find that you're in a relationship like this, if you find that you're in a group like this, you need to wonder why it is that that just keeps happening. You can't be responsible for everything, especially if the things that you're doing are being done because you're being told to do them, because you're being advised by a leader to do them, or that maybe things are not working out because that's the way it's designed. Because if everything worked out and you were perfectly happy, you might feel like leaving and say, oh, you know, actually life is good. And I'm feeling confident. I'm feeling sure. And we know that manipulators never want you to feel that. So if there is that absolute equation, everything bad is on you, everything good is on them, know that that is done very much on purpose to make you feel that you can't rely on yourself and to make you feel like you're a ticking time bomb, that you are just waiting for something bad to happen around the corner. And in fact, you'll bring it in, as one cult says. You will make it happen. You will realize it. You'll manifest it. I'm using more kind of culty words here. But what I think is an interesting connection is also when she was talking about the need for society to provide people with certain things that it only partially provides and sometimes only in certain places, certain neighborhoods, certain communities. There is a need in society to provide people with a sense of equality, with opportunities, and with community. Equality, opportunity, community. Very important points. And so what is the link so often people will get involved in a group because they're looking for opportunity. They're also looking for meaning. They're also looking to, I think, level the playing field. They're tired of a hierarchy within mainstream society, and they think by getting involved in a group, that's a cultic group, which will often portray itself as we are all the same and we are all equals and we all conform and we might believe the same, even dress the same. 
and live in the same place. It has the guise, it has this sort of fake pretense of seeming like the group is into equality, but really the leadership will always be above you. The leader will always be able to do things that you can't. The leader will benefit from whatever money you bring in. You won't, they will. And so there really isn't equality. You also don't have equal rights to the leadership. The rules only apply to you. And the leader can say or do whatever they want. That is not the picture of equality. It just appears that way. It's just a facade. But so many people are craving that. They're tired of being the ones without. They're tired of seeming and feeling less than. And so if we're all the same, and we're all kind of suffering in the same way, then we all have something in common, and then no one seems above me. But that's also a false kind of control mechanism that's put on those communities where everyone really is pushed down. Everyone is kept from opportunities. They're not given equal opportunity. They're equally kept from the same opportunities. It's very different. What is also interesting, too, is that if you're part of a community, then if you're walking around always blaming yourself, you have people there who might actually really respect you and like you. And if they're treating you respectfully, they'll be honest with you and they'll set you straight and say, actually, no, that's not all on you. Mm, That's not necessarily your fault. You will have a frame of reference. You'll have people who talk to you, who know you, who want to clarify things for you. And within a cultic system, there aren't those people. They're not allowed to be those people to each other. They're not allowed to really be open and honest in the same way that they can be in a community outside because everyone's working to be liked by the leader or to stay off the hot seat that they'll be put on by the leader. So people are kind of watching their own backs and can't be fully open and honest. And... When people are damaged by people they're going to for help, like going to a therapist who is taking advantage of that role, like going to anyone who's going to take advantage of their power, you will also have a community to fall back on where they can let you know if something bad like that happened to them at the hands of this person. Or if you feel traumatized, you'll have people to go to. You don't have to just go back to that therapist who's harming you to talk about how traumatized you feel. You can go outside when you have community. And if anyone, of course, because we've talked about this in the past, if anyone keeps you from having access to a community, then know that they want to be able to continue doing whatever they want to you without you having a safety net without you having people who you can fall back on, who will hold you, who won't let you fall, who won't let you be abused and misused. It is very important that our society, the world at large, provides people with more equality and opportunity and community. It's more than important. It's actually vital. And I think cults wouldn't do as well as they do if society offered more of this something to think about. And think about the community you live in and what you might do to help build more equality, more opportunity, and more community into your environment and the people around you. It'll be interesting to see if it creates this kind of beautiful oasis where then people won't be searching for something as much because they're already receiving it. Take good care. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore Indoctrination. We love hearing from you, too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.